My name is Kristen Stewart. I'm a senior research associate in the Office of Research and Evaluation, and I'm lucky enough to work on almost all the projects related to K-3 literacy. Um, and today, we're going to hear about a couple of those projects. So in the School District of Philadelphia, we believe that all students will read on grade level by age eight, and that is one of our ambitious anchor goals. Um, we keep these goals in mind and they guide both our long-term and day-to-day -day work. Anchor goal two, specifically, is critical to ensuring that our children have the foundational literacy skills that they need beyond third grade as they transition from learning to read to reading to learn. We believe that with the right resources and support, every child can and should meet this goal and that our, it's our collective responsibility to reduce any systemic barriers that stand between our children and their ability to read. Often when we talk about grade level literacy, we discuss instructional strategies, literacy interventions, and student reading outcomes. As the district works diligently at addressing these issues, we also seek to better understand other barriers that are associated with reading on grade level. Today we'll hear from internal researchers and external partners and practitioners about two different issues, kindergarten registration and attendance and how, with external support, we are studying and addressing these issues to ensure that every child has the opportunity to maximize his or her potential and reach the ambitious goals set by the school district for our young learners. Before I turn it over to our presenters, I also want to thank the William Penn Foundation, who has invested in these same goals and whose generous support has funded, in part, much of the research that will be presented today. So the first presentation is using evidence to evaluate the barriers to on-time kindergarten registration and inform policy and process. And I will turn it over to my colleague, Katherine Mosier from the Office of Research and Evaluation. Also presenting today is Ryan Fink, research specialist from the Consortium on, for Policy, Research, and Education, Kate Bradstreet, program manager from the Office of Early Childhood Education, and Ami Patel, kindergarten transition fellow from the Office of Early Childhood Education. All right, so first, um, I just want to introduce everybody to our basic um, guiding questions that we had throughout this entire uh, research process. Um, and then that's kind of also the structure that we talked through um, in the presentation. So first, we were all really curious, um, first and foremost, what is the extent of the late, or the late kindergarten registration issue in the school district of Philadelphia? Um, what do parents and school staff say are the factors that contribute to late kindergarten registration? what resources and supports are needed to encourage on-time reg registration, and what changes have been made as a result of the research. I'm Ami Patel Hopkins. Again, I'm the Kindergarten Transition Fellow. Um, my work, again, was generously supported by the William Penn Foundation. Um, and the first question we're going to dive into with you all is, what is the extent of the on-time kindergarten registration issue in the School District of Philadelphia? Um, we really wanted to get to the why, especially when talking to different cities. Philadelphia is not unique in this um, issue, but we wanted to know really what was happening at Philadelphia. Um, before we dive into the actual what came out of our research, I want to just put everyone on the same page around kindergarten registration and the process, because you'll keep on hearing process um, when we talk about it. So um, any educators in the world room are probably really familiar with this, but I'm just gonna go over it really quickly. So the first thing is kindergarten registration happens at the neighborhood school, um, and I put school finder there, but I'll get into that later in the presentation. Um, you gather your documents, so this is what uh, parents have to bring into the neighborhood school when they register. And then um, the, the last two talk kind of about um, the time period it takes. Um, so I'm going to go give it to my colleague, Kate Bradstreet, who's going to dive into the registration data. Good afternoon. I won't make you be a teacher. Okay. <laughs> My name is Kate Bradstreet, and I am from the Office of Early Childhood Education. My uh, role within the office is pre-K to third grade alignment. I'm the program manager. So kindergarten registration falls right into that category. So let's take a look at what does kindergarten registration look like in the district right now. And this is just a snapshot, so this is one year. But just to give you context, um, for those of you familiar with the registration process, we register students 
from typically mid-January through May of the year preceding when a student enters kindergarten. This year, however, the one that's on the screen behind you, you'll see is a little different. So that year, we had to delay registration a little bit to accommodate the adoption of our new student information center, student information system, sorry. And so that year, we started registration in late February, so you'll see the data begins in March. So you'll see, just to give you some context for how this all played out, that first yellow line shows where registration would have ended at our, the end of May. And you'll see we're significantly below 50%. So we extended registration that year into June to try to get closer to 50%. And you'll see we got uh, almost there. That particular year, we uh, also opened registration up during the summer. <laughs> It didn't do a whole lot. As you can see, the summer months didn't really change the needle very much. And then you'll see um, once school opened up again, that's that third yellow line, you'll see that registration really picks up, and in particular during that first week of kindergarten. So just to give you context again, this is over 12,000 kindergarten seats that are available. And before summer started, by the time summer started, we were still at less than 50% registered, okay? So that's just one idea of where we were at. Let's drill down a little bit more and keep in mind that this is the case across networks and in all the whole districts. So this is not specific to any neighborhood or anything like that. This is the case in the district. So of those 12,660 available kindergarten seats, about 47% of those were filled by the beginning of summer. And we consider this to be what we call on-time registration. We're gonna use that phrase a lot, so keep in mind that's what we're talking about. By the time before the first day of kindergarten, we still had 21% of our seats still unfilled. So that gives you some more context of just where we're at with this process. And we would consider students who registered between the summer and the before the first day of kindergarten to be late registrations. And any student that registered after the first day or on the first day of kindergarten or after to be very late. And we had still 7% of our seats still unfilled by that first day of kindergarten. And keep in mind, I'm gonna pop back for a second. You'll notice that in October, uh, those seats really are just about filled. So our problem is not demand. <laughs> Kids want to come to kindergarten. So that's not our problem, is bringing kids into kindergarten. It's really changing when they're registering for kindergarten. And that's really what that graph is showing us. So why does this matter? Why do we even care? <laughs> why are we up here talking to you about this? So registration is important for a variety of reasons. And my colleagues are going to talk a lot about the research side of it, particularly those from our Office of Research, because they're really great like that. From my perspective, from the practice side of things, we uh, families can be engaged earlier. Students and families are able to be excited and ready to, to start school. And in particular, they have the opportunity to be able to in, engage in some kindergarten transition activities. They can come to the school and actually see it. They might be able to meet their teachers. Some schools hand out summer things, activities that teachers and that the families can do with their students. Some schools hand out um, lists of books about kindergarten and the kids can be excited and read over the summer. All of those are things that can help get the families and, and children invested and engaged before summer starts. From an administrator perspective, administrative perspective, both at the district and the teacher level, they can prepare for actual students and their families. We can make sure that we have the resources allocated. We can make sure that the staffing reflects the number of students. Our schools are amazing, and so they're able to be creative in preparing for these students, even though, as you saw, we still don't know about 50% of who's actually coming to the schools. Schools will be ready for students, regardless of when they are registered, but it certainly allows families, students, and schools to be better prepared and be able to engage in those benefits if we know about them ahead of time. So this is from a practice perspective, and now you're gonna to get to hear from my colleagues about what does the research say, both in the district and outside of the district, around why kindergarten registration is so important, and on time, kindergarten registration is so important. It's kind of like a relay presentation. <laughs> um, passed off the baton. So this is also, um, what I'm about to talk about is also really, I think, has important implications for practice. So this isn't just from a research perspective, because obviously um, what I'm about to talk about is really important information for practitioners as well. 
So um, Kate just talked about kind of like, um, she gave us some important context into you know, how many students are really coming in, registering late. Again, about 21% of seats were still not filled by the beginning of kindergarten, and about 7% of seats remained unfilled after kindergarten had started. And some research that we've done in the district um, has shown a statistically significantly different um, average daily attendance, or ADA, between students who register on time for kinder kindergarten and those who register late. So you can see kindergartners who registered on time had an average daily attendance of 94%, so they attended 94% of days. And kindergartners who registered late had an ADA of 89%, and that was a significant difference. Um, so, and that's not including the time that they missed because they were registered late. So that's not even including maybe the one or two weeks that they might have missed at the beginning of school, which as Kate said, can involve some really important transitional activities. Um, and so then we also went on to see um, the relationship between ADA and reading level at the end of kindergarten. So this is looking at students' instructional reading level. Um, and so students with higher ADAs are more likely to be reading at target, which is basically on grade level, by the end of the school year. And then um, also looking many years down the line at their third grade English um, ELA PSSA scores, students with higher ADAs are more likely um, to score proficient on the English PSSA as well. So it's almost like this domino effect. And of course, there are many other factors that influence a student's reading level. It's not all about attendance, but you can start to see these relationships and kind of this flow from students who might be particularly at risk who are registering late, maybe missing more days, and then are really struggling to kind of catch up um, with their academic proficiency. So about 66% of kindergartners who missed zero days of school were reading at Target by the end of the year. And just as sort of a point of comparison that we pulled out, only 46% of kindergartners who missed about two weeks of school were reading at Target by the end of the year. So it's a pretty big difference. Um, and I actually think that um, looking at the ELA PSSA scores, every 1% increase in um, a student's ADA would be realized with a 5% increase. Um, in their score on the PSSA. So we've kind of set up why this is important and not just why it's important kind of from like a programmatic side, but also why it's important for realizing the best outcomes for our students. Um, so once we had that, we really wanted to sort of delve into the data. So this is a big picture of what our data collection process looked like. And I also want to say here that I think one reason why we were able to move through this data collection quickly and smoothly, and it was a very iterative process where like each step really informed the next step, um, the district was already aware that kindergarten registration was um, a particular area that they wanted to focus. And then we were also really lucky to have Ami um, because she was a K transition fellow, so that we had like some extra manpower. Um, we had someone to focus on the issue, and we also had an existing um, relationship with CPRI. So the stage was really set for us to be able to kind of go through this process um, quickly. Um, so it actually started with looking at our annual pre-kindergarten parent survey. Um, we looked at last fall's or last spring's results, so from spring 2017. And we asked a bunch of questions on that survey about kindergarten registration. So we asked parents um, if they have already registered their child for kindergarten how that process was for them, was it difficult, was it easy, um, what kinds of activities they did in the process of registering their child for kindergarten, like did they attend open houses, did they speak to school staff or teachers at the school. Um, and so we used the results from that survey to really inform um, a semi-structured interview protocol. So we took that information, sort of produced a memo, put it out, and then members of ORE staff actually went into um, schools, I think about 12 schools, um, that had moderate on-time registration rates, so about 50% of students um, registered on time at those schools. And they actually went into the school um, during um, registration, the registration period, so there were some parents coming in to register their children then, and also parents coming in to take the kindergarten entrance inventory. Um, so there were parents already coming into schools and ORE staff went and just conducted these you know, semi-formal interviews with parents um, asking questions about their experience with kindergarten registration. So then the results from those um, kind of focused right in to parent focus groups that CPRI and Ryan um, conducted with 139 parents at about 10 schools. And those focus groups were focused on schools with very low rates of on-time registration to really kind of get that perspective. And then also one school that had 
a really high on-time registration rate. So in the process of moving from the semi-structured interviews into the parent focus groups, we were able to hit up schools with really varied registration rates so we could try to get perspectives from as many stakeholders as possible. And then the final step um, was in both the semi-structured interviews and the parent focus groups, something we were hearing over and over again was about the pivotal role that school secretaries actually played in the registration process. They're really kind of like the gatekeepers of the whole process. And so we realized that like our data collection really wouldn't be complete without their perspective. So we used what we had learned um, in the prior three data collection periods to craft a survey to send out to um, school secretaries. We got responses back from 107 secretaries, which I think was actually a great response rate. I want to say like maybe a 91% response rate for that survey. Um, and we asked them about their experiences with the kindergarten registration process. So like what roles they played, what kind of supports they need, what they found to be easier, challenging about the process. And then we also got their perspective on what they thought was challenging for parents, which was also really interesting and instructive. So I'm going to walk through um, with Ryan each one of these to provide some findings from each. And at the end, we're going to tie it together and talk about um, some of the common findings that we found across all of these different um, data collection methods. So moving on to our next question, what do parents and school staff, staff say are the factors that contribute to late kindergarten registration? First, we're going to look at the pre-K findings, pre-K survey findings. So this is a survey that goes out to um, parents of pre-K students in either district-led Head Start or partner program sites. We had about 700 responses um, about the kindergarten registration process. So some parents would have been exited out of the survey because their children were not yet going to their children were not yet going to kindergarten. So this was the subset of parents who had um, children who would be attending kindergarten the next school year. Um, so 85% of respondents whose children were eligible, so old enough to attend kindergarten that coming school year, had already registered their child. So you have to also think about these are parents who are kind of like hooked in to the pre-K network already. So that's just something to think about. We'll talk about that more. Um, and 57% of those parents said they had registered their child at a district school. Um, about 14%, 15% of parents said they hadn't registered their child yet, and then the remainder were, um, had registered their child at a non-district school. Um, about 10% of parents who had already registered their ch child for kindergarten said that registering was difficult or very difficult. So this was kind of like our first um, introduction to some of the reasons that parents really found this process to be difficult. Um, some of them said it was hard to find information about the registration process. Um, their zone school was full, they were put on the wait list. There were some language barriers, so maybe folks weren't able to access information in the language that was accessible to them. Um, too much documentation required to register. If you remember back to um, Ami's slide at the beginning, she talked through um, all the different pieces of paperwork that you need in order to register your child. Um, unclear process and limited hours to register. So those were some of the issues that um, parents brought up on the pre-K survey. Um, parents also talked a little bit about what they did in order to select their child's kindergarten program. So about 91% of parents reported visiting the school before deciding to send their child there. Um, about 85%, again, a lot, the majority of parents really um, had spoken with the principal, teachers, or other school staff. Um, some folks were talking to families whose children already attended the school, so kind of like a word of mouth thing. Um, and then fewer parents um, researched the school online or attended a kindergarten open house. So this kind of gives us a sense also of like what is the parent's entrance point? Where are they making contact with the school for the first time? Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that came out of the semi-structured interviews. And you're going to start to see kind of some themes, I think, across all of these. Um, so one of the questions that we asked parents um, during the semi-structured interviews was why they registered at the time they registered. We didn't ask them why they registered late. That would have been rude. The late in parentheses is how we backcoded it, just so you know. So this <laughs> represents parents who registered late, but we were not trying to put anybody at the spot, on the spot while we were there. Um, and a lot of folks said that they didn't know when registration started or ended. Um, a lot of parents said that they thought the best time to register was the beginning of the school year, which if you think about it, like that's pretty logical, right? Like you know that's the school year your child's going to start, and so you think that's when, you're, that's when you bring them in, right? Why would you think to bring them in the March of the prior year? Um, and then other folks said that it took time to gather the necessary paperwork. We had a lot of folks who said that they had recently moved or relocated over the summer, so then they might not have even been aware of what their zoned school was, or they may have gotten there too late and maybe they didn't get a spot. 
Um, other parents were exploring other options. And a lot of parents actually didn't understand how to locate their zone school, because in some cases, the school that is closest to your home is not, in fact, the school that your students would be zoned to attend, which is kind of confusing, frankly. Um, yeah, so I think that pretty much sums that up. Um, so yeah, a lot of parents were just waiting for the school year to begin, since that's what makes the most sense. We also were curious about how they found out about kindergarten registration, so like, where are they getting their information from? Um, so about 13 parents, so actually um, a lot of parents in this sample um, had communication from their child's pre-K or um, child care center that they were attending, and that was how they heard out about it or found out about it. Um, also, family members are word of mouth, so maybe you have an, a cousin or an auntie or a friend who has a child who's already attending kindergarten. Um, about six parents found out directly from school district communication. Um, some folks already had ch children in the school district, so they knew the process because they had already registered a child for kindergarten. Uh, but there are some, some good quotes here that we kind of pulled out where some folks you know, heard from neighbors, some folks heard from their pre-K center, um, and those were really the two that stood out to us um, as being how most parents were finding out about the kindergarten registration process. Um, parents also talked about some of the challenges that they faced in registering. Again, hard to find information, unclear directions. Um, right now, every, all the paperwork has to be turned in in person. Everything has to be completed in person, so they were frustrated that they weren't able to email, print, or upload forms. Because if you go and you don't have all the necessary paperwork, you have to leave and then find a time to come back. And especially if those hours are in the middle of the workday, that can be really challenging for parents. Um, some folks said that they encountered disorganized or unhelpful staff, um, and that, there, again, there were limited hours and um, locations in order to register. So right now, they can only register at schools. Um, so some difficulties obtaining the proper forms. This was some of the, the interesting things that we learned that we really didn't know. So for example, some pediatricians are charging patients for copies of their students' medical or dental records, which um, is really difficult for a lot of our parents um, to afford these kind of like unanticipated costs. Um, some of them have waits before they can access this information, so it's not like you can go to the doctor and walk away with the form. You might have to wait, and that delays registration. Um, and also, particularly for families who are renting, um, it's really difficult for them to get bills um, in their name. They might be all in the landlord's name, and sometimes they have difficulties getting copies of their leases as well. So there are a lot of challenges that I don't think that we would have necessarily thought about before we started this process. So now Ryan's gonna talk a little bit about the focus group findings. Thanks, Katie. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Ryan Fink from the Consortium of Policy Research and Education at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and yeah, we got looped into this uh, great work that the district was doing um, and, you know, the sort of the iterative nature of this uh, is exactly what happened. I mean, uh, me and my team were brought in, hearing about the interviews that were being done at schools, how might we build on what we're learning and take that to the focus groups. And the idea behind the focus groups was, um, as has already been stated, um, to get out, one, to speak to many more parents, but also to target schools specifically that we saw that had uh, particularly low registration rates. Um, and so the only thing I'll add on, on that is that we ended up talking mostly, so these were done in the fall of 2017, and we ended up talking mostly with parents of current kindergartners. Uh, some first grade parents slipped in, there were people at the schools helping us recruit folks to come and join in the focus groups, uh, but for the most part, uh, we were talking with parents of current kindergartners. Um, and so the first thing we started with, obviously, the main thing we wanted to hear about them was barriers to on-time registration. Um, and again, you're going to hear themes that have already been brought up and a lot of the work and a lot of the things we heard in the focus groups reinforced that. Um, the first one being there was just um, a clear sort of uh, misunderstanding about that registration window. Um, Kate mentioned it starts in as early as January and goes through May. Um, as Katie was just talking about, parents believe that if their child was there and ready on the first day of school, that they had registered them on time. Again, being unaware of these sort of district definitions of what, what it means to be on time. So that spike that we saw in, on Kate's slide earlier uh, from August and September, those were a lot of the parents that I seemed to be talking to and said, oh, I was here. Last week, we got registered. My son or daughter was here on the first day of school. And so I think the, the biggest thing was 
I didn't know that I could register that early, and I didn't know, even more uh, importantly, at least for this group, um, that the district would want me to register that early. They just didn't realize that it was a priority. Um, we also heard some folks talking about considering other options, uh, wondering about other neighborhood schools, um, uh, having their child on a wait list at a charter school, and kind of I was waiting to hear back about that, and so I was waiting to come register until that happened, or the, the lotteries for the charter schools some parents mentioned waiting for. Uh, Katie also already mentioned parents relocating. Um, this was a bit surprising to me. I heard that more than I would have anticipated going in. Folks moving a lot, obviously, particularly over the summer when they do that. Schools are closed. You saw not a big blip on the summer registration, and so they're moving, they're getting settled. They have to figure out where, the, which, uh, what catchment area they're in, what neighborhood school is theirs, and so those folks are obviously gonna be part of this uh, late registration group as well. And then we've heard about the documentation. Um, and Katie already mentioned some of the uh, challenges that parents face in getting all of that stuff together, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. Um, th this is just a quote from one of the parents, again, about sort of, sort of the lack of, lack of aware, people that don't have a child already in the system at all and have no communication with, currently with a school really basically said, well, we would have no idea. How would we know that you wanted us to come in then? We figured, okay, it's August, school's getting ready to start, I'll go in and get it all taken care of. And again, to them, um, they were, that's exactly what they, they should have been doing. Um, so for, we did talk with some folks. Um, so we did target low registration schools, but we also purposely went to one school that was kind of an outlier in their peer group that had exceptionally high registration rates. So we did end up talking with some parents who had registered, again, on time in that sort of winter, spring window, um, and, and asking them about how they knew about it. Um, most often we heard, and again, we've heard this already, um, people that were affiliated with a pre-K provider, especially those that are housed within district schools, or within some sort of district provider, that was off, often the reason, you know, some folks would say, this was a really priority for my pre-K provider. They made sure that we all knew what our catchment schools were. They made sure that we all went and registered. They helped us figure out the documentation. Um, so there was a lot of variation there in the extent to which providers actually worked with parents or encouraged parents to do this on time. Um, communication from the school, again, this only works if you have a child in the school already. Um, so some schools do send flyers home or put out information in the office or whatever, but again, uh, so that was effective for folks that were already connected to the school in some way, but not, not so much for uh, folks that were connected outside of there. And then the word of mouth, which we're going to keep talking about because it keeps coming, coming up and just talking about people talking to people. That's how we find out. And going back to like the sort of misunderstanding about the registration window was the same thing. It says, my neighbor told me to come the first week of September. She told me that was the best, you know, so all of this information gets passed through that way. Um, so in this neighborhood, that's, that's it. If you don't come to the parent meetings, you're not gonna know unless a neighbor tells you um, that this is when you're supposed to come in to do it. Uh, so back to uh, kind of getting the word out for folks who basically said, I didn't know this was a priority. Um, asking parents what would be the best way for the district to, to get that message out to you. Um, obviously, social media, right? I love this. Everyone's on it. People wake up and look at that before they look at the news. Like, spot on. Um, community flyers and posters, they just talked about places in the neighborhoods that people frequent, ball fields, you know, grocery stores, places that people are going to see these things. They said, these things are hanging up all over the place. I've never seen one about kindergarten registration. Why don't you guys, you know, put them up in our neighborhoods? Um, back to the coordination with pre-Ks and child care providers, people see that as I go to my child care provider, they don't say anything to me. If they had given me some information about it, that would have at least alerted, to, alerted me uh, that this was something that needed to get done. And then a couple folks uh, recommended something cool I thought was these school community events where a neighborhood school could hold some sort of community event, you know, I think, I think bouncy house came up, right? Like get a bounce house, have a barbecue, invite the community in and use it as a venue to get information out, especially to new families. 
Um, and the last thing I'll talk about here is just about improving that process. So we didn't overwhelmingly hear that the process itself was so difficult and there were obstacles at every turn that made this so hard for me to get done. Um, however, there were suggestions um, about how to make that easier for parents. And one of them, uh, and Katie's gonna talk next about the secretaries, one of them was just sort of the variation at which school staff was helpful and could sort of help parents find the information that they need, could help organize that information with them. We heard stories of amazing, like I couldn't have done it without that secretary. She really helped and made sure I knew exactly what I needed and where and she kept my things and I said I'll be back in two days with the next one and they were great. And then we heard stories where people were less helpful. Um, and so that's one. Um, this thing about getting information out there and the types of information that they need. So they specifically asked about, and Katie referenced this to not only the documents that are needed as Ami shared, but also the cost associated with them. So if you need to go get a replacement birth certificate, um, and yes, doctors, I, I know from experience, doctor's offices charge for copies of medical records. Um, parents would love a list of here are the documents, here's, if you don't have them, here's, a, here's where you go to get them and here's potential fees that might be associated with those. Um, and again, talking about this transition stuff of having kids ready, um, getting the materials, knowing what the materials would need for the first day. And then they talked about, again, especially folks that were moving, uh, knowing what their school catchment area was, um, and then also these deadlines for registration. Um, and I think that's it. So again, I mean, we're gonna move to the secretary survey here, um, and then we'll bring it all back together. But again, a lot of this stuff was reassuring for us as we went through the process was to hear sort of things being reinforced uh, through the different people that we were speaking with. So the final piece of this was the secretary survey. This was kind of like the final point in our data triangulation here. Um, so we asked secretaries overall to talk about um, what, was, what they thought was the most challenging. So as I go through this, just keep in mind that this is secretaries talking about what they think is the most challenging for parents, um, so what they perceive um, as most challenging. So, um, and uh, these won't sum because secretaries could choose multiple reasons. Um, so difficulties obtaining proof of address residency was what most secretaries said um, parents had difficulty with in the registration process. Um, not knowing about the registration deadline being the end of the prior school year, not understanding what the required documents are, difficulties obtaining immunization records. I mean, a lot of these are kind of about the, the records in general, and not knowing which school is their neighborhood school. Um, those were the top reasons that um, secretaries reported uh, parents had difficulty registering on time. Um, and then also a couple of you know other um, responses, including procrastination. Some secretaries just thought that parents were kind of intentionally waiting until the last minute. Um, high mo mobility, which we've talked about, having kind of a transient um, family population. And then also the overall, just that the process was not always very clear. Um, we also asked secretaries to, um, to talk about um, these issues by registration time. So we asked, what did you think was the biggest issues for parents who, who registered on time? What did you think was the biggest issue for parents who registered late? And the biggest issues for parents who registered very late? And by and large, the responses were actually pretty consistent, except for these questions. We did see some differences by registration time. So secretaries reported that parents who registered on time um, were actually more unclear about which school was their neighborhood school than parents who registered at different times. And again, you can decide whether or not you think some of these <laughs> make logical sense, but this is their perspective on it. Um, they also thought that parents who registered on time um, struggled more with language barriers. And then parents who registered late or very late overall seem to have more difficulty navigating the registration process, which sort of makes sense, right? They might have had so much difficulty that it's actually causing them to register late or very late. Um, and then particularly um, obtaining proof of guardianship documentation was something that they saw really slowing down the process for parents who registered late or very late. Um, they also noted a couple of um, almost special circumstances or things that came up for them that they really didn't know how to handle or they didn't feel quite prepared to handle. Um, so some of them were custody challenges. So the person who came to register the child may not have been able to prove custody or didn't have any required documentation around that. Um, sometimes this was 
related to parents living in a different place. Sometimes the parents were incarcerated. Uh, maybe they were sick. Maybe they were their grandma was watching them, but the, the grandmother was not actually their legal guardian, for example. Um, permanently destroyed or missing documents. So families who maybe went through um, a house fire or some other kind of natural disaster who weren't able to produce the documents for that reason. Um, residency falsification. Um, some secretaries mentioned that they were concerned that parents were falsifying their residency documents. Um, because there wouldn't be like a landlord's signature on a lease, for example. Um, and then sometimes um, parents would try to register their child, but they would not have a copy of the IEP, or there would be students whose, um, whose first language was not English, and they had never been tested for language competencies, and so they weren't really sure how to handle that. And then finally, they had some parent or some children come in um, where the child maybe didn't wasn't five yet, but they had attended kindergarten in another country, and they weren't sure whether or not that was enough of a minimum requirement to register them for kindergarten here. So I'm sure you've sort of managed to see which, which of these themes were really common um, across all of the different um, data collections that we did. And I think a couple that jumped out to us was that the on-time registration period was not widely understood. There had been some messaging around quote unquote early registration, which was actually on time registration, so that was like pretty low hanging fruit and being like, oh, probably if we talk about it clearly that will help. Um, obtaining the required documentation was one of the primary challenges. Um, a highly transient population was very challenging. Um, having communication happen by word of mouth, which sometimes means um, unclear information. Um, we also noticed that parents who are connected to a pre-K provider actually might have more accurate or timely information about kindergarten registration. Um, parents who register late or very late have more difficulty, and also schools really need to provide more outreach opportunities. So now we're going to talk about how we took this information and translated it into action. So Ami's going to talk us through that. The most exciting it part. Is, it is the most exciting part. <laughs> um, so I, I, this really is exciting to me um, because now we can see, oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, we could see what we did in the past two years that I've been at the district um, working with all of these partners. So um, the, we, we divided it up into buckets. Um, and so to respond to the certain themes that were coming out, right? So one big one was around communication and really making it clear that you can actually register between January and May. Um, and even messaging, so we put messaging and communication. So an example of messaging is, um, I was hearing, as I heard partners talk, or even internally um, saying early registration. So we just changed that to be registration. <laughs> registration is now open. We will take parents as they come in, but just by saying registration versus early registration, that was like a messaging shift um, that we were um, really deliberate about. Also, something else we did was just, um, uh, we always had the information online, um, but making it more accessible. Um, so I worked with the Office of Student Enrollment. A lot of our questions that come to our office around kindergarten registration have to do with custody issues, um, documentation stuff. So worked closely in partnership with the um, Office of Student Placement Enrollment, and we created a kindergarten registration website, a website devoted just to information on kindergarten registration. Even shortening the URL was something that we focused on. So it's just philasd.org backslash kregistration, so everyone can talk about it, and it's easy to like remember. Um, and some of those themes you saw, right, like, how do I find my school? What is my neighborhood school? I live in the Germantown East Falls section of the city, and our neighborhood school is not the one closest to us. So um, that's where um, this part here, so identify your school. Um, and making, and then you saw language barrier was one of the other pieces. So we put the information up um, through the kindergarten registration flyer, and then you see the other languages. And we also worked with IT on School Finder, so when you click on that and go to the other flyers in our nine main languages, um, then they, when they click on that flyer and then click on the School Finder link, it will be in their language that is in the flyer. So really thinking about accessibility, too. Um, and then some, some of the other common questions around 
specialized services, um, multilingual families, and putting those on the side so people can see them. Um, we're also working, um, the, that banner there, I don't know, some of you might have seen them outside in the city, um, but this is really working on the branding. And this was actually created by our Swenson, our Swenson Digital Media Arts students. I actually just went and talked to them, told them what the issue was, and I was like, think about your own neighborhood, think about your siblings. What, what would they want to see on a school that would be like, oh, let me go inside of the school? A welcoming piece, again, messaging and promotion. So um, that, they created that. I didn't really guide them on the design, and when I look at it, I see myself in that banner, and I think it really, um, so it plays dual role for principals and school staff to be like, our students in the school district of Philadelphia created this, like this is the system your child is about to enter, but also come in, we are welcome, welcome. Um, so that's on the website. Um, another thing we did was work on a memorandum of understanding with the um, city of Philadelphia's public health department. Um, the city of Philadelphia public health department owns birth rate data. So they know who's kindergarten eligible in the city based off of that birth rate data. So we worked on, we took us a year, but we worked on a memory. I know the lawyers in the room will appreciate how long it took us, um, but we worked and we were able to um, establish a memorandum of understanding that will be renewed annually. Um, and so this year, we were, Dr. Height um, was able to send out letters to 20,000 kindergarten eligible families in the city, um, explaining the process to them. Um, and then I talked about the banners, because that was my favorite part, but all of this is really. Um, also, we, um, in our pre-K survey, so you all heard about the surveys we did this year, uh, we were able to put the School Finder link and the kindergarten registration website in that link. So the pre-K parents that were taking the survey, were able, they will be able to get more information on kindergarten. And this was really exciting to me because as I was talking to other cities, I was like, oh, you did this. Did it show impact on your data? And they're like, oh, we don't measure that. So it's exciting for me that now, um, when we do the pre-K survey this year, we will be able to, we put letter from the superintendent, big banner outside, like how are you hearing about it? Um, so we will be able to see, and then also, I've been working with Kate and telling her exactly when those letters went out, exactly when everything happened to see, again, the graph to see if that had anything. Because it's really, and this is where the research was so helpful, is where do we focus, right? Like talking to people are like, oh, SEPTA ads, but it's like, is that really how we're going, you know, what, what is it? And this helps us to really focus, and as I'm transitioning out of this role, it really isn't about me, but it's about what's been created and how the district can continue to use those systems and what's been created to continue working on this issue. They don't need to replace me necessarily, it's just who do you work with, and, and then I'll be able to leave all the information with them to continue the work. Um, also, our pre-K partners and child care providers in the city. This is an exciting time for the city and the state where um, pre-K is a big thing. The mayor isn't really, oh, sorry. Um, so, the, so we'll be able to, and internally we have 10,000 um, pre-K seats in our school district. So how do we continue to work with them we already are working with them, they, and we heard that parents are connected to the pre-K provider are, know about on-time registration. So how do we continue to coordinate with them? And then I see like a lot of partners in this room that I recognize from Read by Fourth meetings or what have you. So externally working with partners, I've been talking to the Office of Adult Education and different like different city agencies even. So everyone is aware because Everyone in this room knows someone that's going to be five on or before September 1st. And so um, it could be your neighbor, it could be your niece or nephew. So, okay, how my hope for the city would be if you're going to the grocery store and checking out, oh, your child's five, did you know? So it just becomes the most exciting thing in the city of Philadelphia. So thank you.